estrategias de integración. Comencemos con esto que se parece a algo que ya vimos. El tipo de, de ejemplo, el tipo de pretexto para entrar a esto. El promedio del valor de una función. In this tutorial, we'll discover how to find the average value of a function. Let's start off with an example. Suppose you have a car, and say it's cruising along at 20 miles an hour for an hour. On the graph of speed versus time, the speed is constant at 20 miles an hour for the first hour. Then, after an hour, the car spends the next two hours going 50 miles an hour. First, what's the total distance that the car has traveled? ¿Cuál es la distancia total que está recorriendo el automóvil? La distancia no, la velocidad, la, la, la... Sí, la distancia total que ha viajado el vehículo. Viaja a 20 millas por hora por una hora y viaja a 50 millas por hora por tres horas. ¿Cuál fue la distancia que recorrió? No el tiempo, no la velocidad, sino la distancia. 120. 120. Let's look at each segment of the trip individually. The first segment of the trip is one hour long, and it travels 20 miles an hour for an hour. So the total distance traveled in the first part of the trip is 20 miles. The second part of the trip is two hours long. During that time, the car moves at 50 miles an hour. If it's traveling for two hours at 50 miles per hour, then it travels a total distance of 100 miles. So the sum of these two is 120 miles. Pero, ¿qué más? Nicely done. In the first hour, the car is traveling at 20 miles per hour for an hour. So the total distance traveled in the first hour is the speed multiplied by the time, which is the area under this portion of the curve. The hour up here cancels out the hour down here, meaning this first leg of the trip went for 20 times 1 miles. The second leg of the trip was at 50 miles per hour for 2 hours, so the area under this part of the curve is 50 times 2 miles. 20 times 1 is 20, and 50 times 2 is 100. So the total distance the car traveled is 120 miles. That means that the integral of this function is 120 miles. Next, what was the average speed of the car? Ahora, ya sabemos el tiempo que viajó, la velocidad a la que viajó y la distancia que recorrió. ¿Cuál fue su velocidad promedio? Exactly. The car's average speed is the total distance it traveled, which was the integral of this function with 120 miles, divided by the total time the car was traveling, which was 3 hours. 120 miles divided by 3 hours is 40 miles per hour, which is over here on the vertical axis. Let's think a little more about what this average speed means. Suppose this car in blue travels like the blue function over here. It spends an hour at 20 miles per hour, and then two hours at 50. And suppose this purple car spends all three hours of the trip traveling at 40 miles per hour, the average speed of the blue car. Then the purple car travels at a constant speed, while the speed of the blue car changes over time. But both of these cars travel the 120 miles in exactly the same three hours. 
Now suppose you have a more complicated graph of speed versus time. For this graph, what is the total distance traveled between the second and ninth hours? Bien. Imaginemos que ahora es otro vehículo, otro automóvil que está viajando. Pero su velocidad cambia de manera infinita en el trayecto. Eh, ¿Qué tan lejos ha viajado ese vehículo? Sí, entre las 2 y las 9 horas de viaje. Viajó más tiempo. Pero nada más nos interesa entre la segunda y la novena hora de, de, de viaje. Eh, ¿Qué tan lejos ha llegado? How far? La B. La C. La C. Ah, bueno, la C o la D llegó primero. O sea, la, vamos a hacerle caso a que llegó primero. Es que andabas de viaje. We saw before that the total distance traveled between two points in time, here, two and nine is given by the area under this curve, between 2 and 9. We can represent the area as an integral. We would take the integral between 2 and 9 of v of t, dt. Okay. Entonces ya vemos, ejemplos, quizá a un tanto insulsos, nadie va por la calle o en el carro calculando la integral del viaje. Quizá sería sensato empezar a hacerlo. Right. The distance traveled is the integral of this graph. You can write the total distance traveled between hours 2 and 9 as the integral of the speed, v of t, from t equals 2 to t equals 9. So what would you say is the average speed of this car between hours 2 and 9? Si la distancia total corresponde a la integral planteada. ¿Cuál sería? Aparentemente habría que resolver la integral. ¿Cómo queda la resolución de la integral? Quizá antes de resolverla, habría que simplificar. Vamos a ver. We know that the average speed can be computed by taking the total distance traveled and dividing it by the amount of time it took to travel that distance. We just computed the total distance here. It's this integral. All we have to do now is divide it by the time interval, which is given by 9 minus 2. Y entonces, ¿cuál es? La B, así es. Precisely. The average speed is the total distance divided by the time it took to travel that distance, which was 9 minus 2, or 7, hours. Let's move the denominator out front. Now suppose instead of time and speed, we make this a generic variable. Let's call it x. And suppose the vertical axis is f of x. And instead of two hours and nine hours, we're looking at this function f between the points a and b. Can you come up with the general formula for finding the average value of a function between these two points? ¿Cuál sería entonces la formula para el promedio? La formula general, digamos. Very well done. Here's the formula you came up with. The average value of this function f equals 1 over b minus a times the integral of f from a to b. 
For this function here, the height of this line represents the average value of the function. Let's consider the area under the average value. If we rearrange this equation you came up with by multiplying both sides by b minus a, we see that the average value of the function times b minus a equals the integral of f from a to b. This integral on the right side represents the area of the blue region under the curve. Meanwhile, the average value of f is the height of this rectangle, and b minus a is the width of the rectangle. In other words, the area of this purple rectangle equals the area under the curve. And that's another way to think about the average value of a function. It's the height of the rectangle whose area equals the area of the integral over the same region. Next, you'll get a chance to make your own function and see its average value. In this interactive, first you can make any function you want by editing this blue curve. The orange line here indicates the average value of your function. And the area of the rectangle underneath that line equals the blue area under the curve. Try making a function that's almost always larger than its average value. Bien, ahora hagamos una función. Eh, la función recuerden esta. Esta es de esta forma. Y nos está pidiendo ver una función cuyo eh, promedio sea mayor que el promedio es este, sea mayor que la función este, no al revés que la función sea mayor que el promedio que, el promedio, que la función durante el mayor intervalo de, de tiempo tal vez tenga valores mayores que el promedio mismo vamos a ver esa función que dibujo ahí no. aquí es mayor el promedio en este intervalo grande es menor que el promedio y en este intervalo que es más corto es mayor a 15 parece que la suma de este más este no es mayor que estos intervalos ¿cómo tendría que ser? pues menos ¿cómo haría? lo que puedo hacer es eh. no Sí, el naranja es todo más el azul más el naranja solo. ¿Dónde no está el azul solo? Si le hago así. Ahí no. Ahí también. A ver, tal vez ahí. Sí. sí. Efectivamente. O sea, este intervalo es mayor que este intervalo. Entonces no es que más que el promedio. O sea, tiene un valor más grande que el promedio. So to recap, this is the formula you discovered for finding the average value of a function. Let's try an example with a quadratic function. Here's the function 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Try finding the average value of this function between x equals 0 and x equals 2. For this sketch, the average value would be something like this, but you'll want to use this formula to find the exact answer. ¿Cuál es el valor promedio de esa función? Esta es la función y aquí nos traza que este sería parte del valor promedio hasta 2. ¿Cuánto vale f de x aquí? Sí, aquí habría que resolver con la fórmula general para entender. Tenemos el intervalo desde 0 hasta 2. De 0 a 2 sería 1 entre 2 menos 0 por la integral de f de x de x. Aquí está la función, la integral de esta función desde a hasta b. La resolvemos. O, o en visto de que estamos en la semana 8 terminando, eh, le pedimos para ir un poco más rápido la resolución. Remember that if you have a function that looks like x to the n, an antiderivative 
is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So in antiderivative of 3x squared is 3 times x cubed over 3, or x cubed. An antiderivative of 2x is 2 times x squared over 2, or x squared. And an antiderivative of 1 is x. Try using these antiderivatives to evaluate this integral. Mm -hmm. Here's an antiderivative of our function. To compute this integral, we have to evaluate it at a and b. Here, a is 0 and b is 2. The integral is equal to big F of 2 minus big F of 0. So let's evaluate this. Big F of 2 is 8 plus 4 plus 2. That's a total of 14. F of 0 is 0 plus 0 plus 0, which is 0. So this integral is equal to 14. And that's this part of the expression. So now what we have to do is take this 14 and divide it by b minus a. Here you'll prove what's called the mean value theorem. Let's start off with any old function that's both continuous and smooth, like this one here. And now let's pick two points on the function. And here's the line that connects them, known as a secant line. Note that there's a point between these two with a tangent line that has the same slope as the secant line. Can you draw a smooth function connecting these points whose instantaneous slope is never equal to the slope of this secant line? Bien, es posible hacer una función suave que conecte dos puntos de modo que la derivada nunca sea igual a la pendiente de la línea secante entre los puntos. ¿Cierto o falso? ¿Sí o no? Let's look at the slope of the tangent line at this leftmost point. This slope is negative. On the rightmost point, this slope is positive. This means that no matter what happens to the function between these two points, the slope has to turn around eventually because it's a smooth function. So there will always be a point that has this slope. Well, that's very interesting. For any smooth function you draw between these two points, the derivative of that function will equal the slope of this secant line somewhere between the points. Let's see if we can prove why that is. First, let's label the x-coordinates of these two points, a and b. And let's draw another function, which we'll call f. Then this point has a y-coordinate, f of a, and this point has a y-coordinate, f of b. Consider the derivative of f between points a and b. What would be an expression for the average value of the derivative between a and b? Bien, ¿cuál es el promedio de la función del de, de, de valor de la derivada entre a y b? ¿De acuerdo a lo que vimos antes? ¿Cuál sería la forma? ¿A, b, c o d? ¿Cuál se parece? La B. La B. Ok. 
process. We're not looking for the average value of f. We're looking for the average value of the derivative of f between a and b. That is, the average value of f prime of x. The average value between a and b of f prime of x is the integral of f between a and b divided by the integral, which is b minus a. Well done. You remember that the average value of a function between a and b is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral of the function from a to b. The derivative of f is a function, so you can plug f prime into this formula to find the average value of the derivative. So the average value of f prime is 1 over b minus a times the integral of f prime from a to b. Try evaluating this definite integral. Entre la A y la C. O sea, la B. Entre la A y la C está la B. Voy a hacer la A, podría hacer la B. Vamos a ver la A. F prime of X is the derivative of F of X. That means that the antiderivative of F prime of X is just F of X. To evaluate the integral, we take the antiderivative f of x and evaluate it at b and a. Good work. Let's see what you did with this integral. The antiderivative of f prime is f, so this definite integral is equal to f evaluated at the upper limit, b, minus f evaluated at the lower limit, a. So let's plug this back into our expression for the average value of f prime. And let's move this expression into the numerator of this fraction. Great. So you found that the average value of the derivative of f between the points a and b is equal to f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. Now for a separate question. What's the slope of this secant line? The slope of any line is the change in y divided by the change in x. The change in y is f of b minus f of a. The change in x is this distance here, which is b minus a. Okay, so it turns out that the average value of the derivative between the points a and b is equal to the slope of the secant line between a and b. That's pretty interesting. Next, you'll make your own function and explore when that function is equal to its average value. In this interactive, you can edit the blue function here. The orange line represents the average value of your function over this entire range. Notice that this function equals its average value over here. But does a continuous function always have to equal its average value somewhere? In other words, suppose x equals a over here and x equals b over here, and the average value of the function is z. Then does there always have to exist a point in between a and b where the function equals z? Existe un número C cualquiera. Este tal vez. De modo que eh, C y Z esté entre esos intervalos de A y B. Hay un valor ahí sí siempre o no. ¿Es cierto o es falso?
¿Sí? ¿Es cierto? This question is asking us whether any function we make, we're calling it f of x, must equal its average value somewhere. It doesn't matter where, and it could happen more than once, but it has to be somewhere. And we're going to call one of these points c. And the value of that point is f of c. It looks like no matter what we do, there's no way to escape the average value. If the function is higher than the average in most places, then there has to be some place where it's lower than the average. Since the function is continuous, that means that it must cross the horizontal line somewhere. Yeah, in this case, vamos, C no sería este, sería este. Okay, so you found that continuous functions must equal their average value at some point. This fact is known as the intermediate value theorem. If you apply the intermediate value theorem to f prime, it says that at some point between a and b, f prime must be equal to the average value of f prime. And let's call that point c. For the function we've drawn here, the c would be over here. This is where the derivative is equal to its average value, which is in turn equal to the slope of the secant line. So for smooth functions like this one, the derivative must be equal to the slope of the secant line somewhere between the two points that define the secant line. This fact is known as the mean value theorem, and you've just proven it. Now let's see the mean value theorem in action. You're driving a car down a highway with some traffic, and you see mile marker 105 at 7 o'clock. And then two hours later, you pass mile 185 at 9 o'clock. What speed or speeds must your speedometer have reported at some point during those two hours? Bien. Eh, manejamos un vehículo radical. Desde las 7 y las 9 horas, este, el velocímetro marca 108. Eh, ¿A qué velocidad deberíamos ir para que el velocímetro pudiera tener ese valor en ese intervalo? ¿Cuál sería la velocidad promedio? La. ¿Ah? ¿Cuál es la pregunta, maestro? Sí, a ver. Tenemos que encontrar el valor promedio de esto. De, de esta. ¿Cuál sería? Eh, tu velocidad promedio entre la séptima y la octava hora ¿cuál es si esto está marcando tu velocidad? ¿a cuánto tendrías que ir para que el velocidad te marcara? pero vas de manera errática es decir, no, no vas en manera de este forma lineal cualquiera que sea así ¿cómo sería? vamos a ver Let's first figure out what the average speed of the car was. If we started at mile marker 105 and ended at 185, then the total distance traveled was 80 miles, and the time that it took was 2 hours. So the average speed is equal to 80 miles divided by 2 hours, or 40 miles per hour. That means that the slope of this line is equal to 40. Now, that doesn't mean that the car had to be traveling at exactly 40 miles per hour the whole way. The path could have looked like this, or it could have looked like this. What does the mean value theorem tell us? Millas, más o menos, ¿cuál es el kilómetro? Y 185 unidades de distancia en este intervalo para tener este trayecto de dos horas de aquí a acá, la velocidad promedio fue de 80. ¿Qué la permite? No importa cómo haya llegado. En algún momento dado, tu velocímetro marcó eso. A veces más, a veces menos. Hay un valor intermedio que siempre aparece. O sea, se confirma a través de ese ejemplo cotidiano que es verídico el teorema del valor promedio. Ahora, a veces 
A veces eh, hay fenómenos que cuando estamos midiendo cosas, ¿sí? por ejemplo, podemos estar viendo, hemos hablado varias veces de lo, un ejemplo que es muy bueno porque lo hacen todos los biólogos de una u otra manera. Llegan a toparse con la medición de productividad. La productividad, eh, ya sea que sea tu objetivo central o uno complementario o un dato necesario para el objetivo final, esto tiene que ver con eh, la interacción de luz y materia. De hecho, no solamente la fotosíntesis depende de ese fenómeno de interacción de luz y la materia. Nuestra visión, la visión desde los tratamientos que son los más simples que tienen algo parecido a la visión tiene que ver con la interacción de la luz con la materia como la materia absorbe o no luz y en todo caso si recordamos los hallazgos de Newton ¿qué color de luz? a estos diferentes colores le llamamos espectro entonces diferentes sustancias sustancias que vemos verdes como el color de tu playera absorben algún tipo de luz excepto la verde absorben rojo, amarillo, azul, violeta, pero no verde. Tu mochila roja absorbe todo menos el rojo. ¿Sí? Absorbe la verde, por ejemplo. ¿Sí? Tu pantalón azul absorbe todo menos el azul. Y a veces, si imaginen que tenemos esos tres pigmentos juntos, van a estar absorbiendo alguna y reflejando otra y van a estar absorbiendo, absorbiendo a veces de la misma, la misma este, color de luz, el mismo espectro de luz. Y entonces a veces tenemos espectros encimados. ¿Qué podemos hacer cuando tenemos eso? Hay que determinar áreas específicas. Here you'll discover how to use integrals to find the areas between curves. But let's start off with a plain old integral. Here's the function y equals e to the x. What's the area under this curve between x equals 0 and x equals 3? Eh, ¿Cuál es el área de en esa función que nos pone para empezar a pensar en esto? Es una función exponencial, base e, elevada a la x, y cuando x vale 3, y vale esto. ¿Cuánto es eso? y porque necesita alguien necesita un valor para poder determinar el área bajo la curva de la función el área bajo la curva sería la integral la integral de e a la x es e a la x porque la derivada de a la x es e a la x pero nos está preguntando entre 0 y 3 aquí vale 0 Necesitamos el teorema de la, de la integral, el teorema general del cálculo. Llévale 20.08. Ah, sí, ok. Pues necesitamos el área. El área bajo la curva. Esa sería más simple que eso. Claro que tenemos la función y a la x. ¿Recuerdan? Sí, a la 3. Sería. Eh, La, no, no, no. la derivada la derivada de eh, menos diferencial ¿Sí? más creo que es así ¿cuánto sería entonces? tenemos e a la x el intervalo mayor la tenemos definida la integral e la integral desde 0 hasta 3 de e a la x. ¿Listo? Antes e a la 3 menos e a la 0. e a la 3 menos e a la 0. ¿Y esto cuánto es? Este, no, no tengo. Ah, ah, no sé qué es el Sí, sí, no, no sé. El... No se depende del modelo. E a la 0 es 1. E a la 0 es 1. Entonces, e, esto es igual a. Y e, e a la 3 es 20. 20.08. 20. 20.08. 1. Redondeando. Entonces sería. 19. 19 o 18.09. 19. 19. A ver, ¿cuánto es 19.08? 18. 
0855, somos muy precisos y nos dice que está correcto. Good. Now suppose you have the function y1 equals x squared. But say you also have the function y2 equals 8 minus x squared. Our next goal will be to find the area between these two functions. Let's draw in some very thin vertical bars to help us out. Suppose each of these bars has a horizontal width of dx. What's the formula for the area of one of these bars? Barras. Entre estas dos funciones que se están empalmando. ¿Cuál sería? ¿Cuánto mide el área de la barrita? Perdí. La B. The area of this bar is the width times its height. We already know the width is dx. We just have to find the height. The top edge of this is given by y2, and the bottom edge of this rectangle is given by y1. So the height is going to be y2 minus y1. Then we multiply it by dx. Exactly. The width of each bar is dx, and the height is y2 minus y1 for each x-coordinate. Adding up the areas of all these bars means we're integrating over a range of x. So this integral represents the area of this region. But what should the limits of this integral be? What are the limits of this integral? It's not defined, because when x equals this, and when x equals this, The limits of the integral are here and here. We just have to find these x coordinates. We can find them by seeing where y1 and y2 intersect, that is, where y1 is equal to y2. y1 is equal to x squared, and y2 is 8 minus x squared. So solve this equation for x and get these coordinates. To solve this equation, we'll add x squared to both sides, giving us 2x squared equals 8, or x squared equals 4. This leaves us with the coordinates x equals plus or minus 2. Nicely done. Yes. The limits of integration are where these two functions intersect, which is at these two points here. At these intersections, the two functions are equal to each other. In other words, x squared equals 8 minus x squared. You added x squared to both sides, and then divided both sides by 2. So x squared equals 4, meaning x can equal plus or minus 2. The left intersection here is the minus 2 solution, and positive 2 corresponds to the intersection over here. Great. So this area corresponds to the integral from minus 2 to positive 2. Now evaluate this integral. Since this is an integral with respect to x, you're going to want to plug in expressions that are in terms of x in place of y1 and y2. Ahora tenemos que encontrar el área entre las funciones de igual a x cuadrada y la función de igual a 8 menos x. Bueno, ya vimos... Ya vimos cuánto mide una barra. Ya vimos cuáles son los intervalos. Cuánto vale el área. Cuánto mide el área. Vamos. ¿Cuánto mide el área? Vamos a llamarlo esto, little f of x. Eso es igual a y2 menos y1 or 8 minus x squared minus x squared, or 8 minus 2x squared. Let's write down an antiderivative now, big F of x. One of them is 8 times x minus 2 times x cubed over 3 from the power rule. 
Now we have to evaluate this between negative 2 and 2. ¿Cuánto es? Menos 8 
entre 3. ¿Sí? No, pero es, es 2 por... Así, 2 por menos 8. 2 por menos 8. ¿Sí? Y esto es entonces, 2 por menos 8 me da menos 16. Entonces, menos 16 menos menos 16 entre 3. ¿Sí? Entonces, menos 16 menos menos 16 entre 3 menos 5.2. 5.3 Y se hace más ¿no? Sí, entonces era 10 menos Menos 16 Sí, 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 ¿Cuánto dice que es? Aquí sería menos 10 punto 7 y entonces el área sería igual a 0. Ah, sí, es cierto. Gracias. Entonces, pues, esto sería... Salud. Gracias. Eh, 10.7 menos 10.7 y entonces el área sería 0. No, no puede ser 0. La segunda está mal. Bueno, lo escribí hace rato y no digo. Y aquí nos está detenido. No, 
sempre che il nostro Ariane è arrivato. 32. Pronto? Sentiamo che si dice, però non lo dico. Non lo Il y a l'heure aujourd'hui, Johan, c'est une bonne passion, il ne comprend pas. Parce qu'il n'y a pas de mal à l'aider. Non. Ah aussi, non aussi. Ah si, non aussi. Let's call this little left foot. That's equal to y2 minus. Let's call this little left of x. That's equal to y2 minus y1, or 8 minus x squared minus x squared. Or 8 minus 2x squared. Let's write down an antiderivative now, big F of x. One of them is 8 times x minus 2 times x cubed over 3 from the power rule. Now we have to evaluate this between negative 2 and 2. Pero, eh, a menos que sea así, sustituyendo a x por menos 2, menos 1, 0, 1 y 2. No, uh -huh. bueno, vamos a probar eso después. Vamos a ver ahorita entonces mejor el, el área bajo la longitud de la curva. You've seen how you can use integrals to find areas between curves, but you can also use them to find the lengths of curves. Here's the parabola y equals x squared. Later on in this tutorial, you'll be finding the length of part of this curve. But let's start with something a little more straightforward, like a straight line. Suppose this line passes through points 1, 2 and 8, 6. What's the length of the line segment between these points? ¿Cuál es la longitud de esta línea en el segmento desde el punto X 1, 2 al punto X 8, 6? Vamos a obtener de qué manera la longitud. Tenemos el primer punto, es. Podemos calcular. ¿Qué es length? Length. No, 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 no,
Entonces, tenemos la longitud en X, sería X2 menos X1. Y esto sería entonces eh, 8 menos 1 es igual a 7. Y Y2 menos Y1 es igual a 6 menos 2 es igual a 4. Tenemos entonces... un triángulo de 7 por 4. ¿Cómo podemos calcular la longitud? Este sería un triángulo rectángulo, entonces sería la hipotenusa. H sería la raíz cuadrada de 7 al cuadrado más 4 al cuadrado, esto es igual a la raíz cuadrada de 49 más 16 y entonces H sería la raíz cuadrada de eh, 5 65 ¿no? y esto es 8.06 Aquí sí, sí, aquí sí le di <laughs> Exactly And you use the Pythagorean theorem To find that answer You can draw a right triangle here The horizontal distance between these points is 7 And the vertical distance is 4 That means that the hypotenuse of this right triangle Has a length equal to the square root of 7 squared plus 4 squared Which you found was approximately 8.062 So you can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of a straight line. Now let's return to a curve. Don't worry about precisely finding the length of this curve just yet. Instead, how might you approximate the length of this curve? ¿Cómo podríamos aproximar la longitud de esa curva? O sea, la longitud de esta distancia. Encontramos ahí abajo la curva, rompemos la curva en cachitos, y fijamos la curva a través del lado X, y decimos que acá. O integramos la derivada de la curva. Rompemos la curva en línea recta. No es mala idea. Yep. To find the length of a curve, we're going to break it into many small line segments. In this interactive, you can make any function you want in blue. These orange line segments are used to approximate the length of the curve. If this small segment here has a width of dx and a height of dy, then what is an equation you can use to find its length, which we'll call ds? Tremendo Pitágoras, pero expresado de una manera moderna. Exactly. So these orange line segments are used to approximate the length of the blue curve. The sum of the lengths of the line segments, each of which is calculated using the Pythagorean theorem, is shown over here. And the actual length of the blue curve is up here. How can you improve this approximation? ¿Cómo puedo mejorar esa aproximación? Usamos menos puntos, usamos más puntos, o las pendientes las hacemos eh, en segmentos de cero. Usamos más puntos. Usamos más puntos. En este caso puedo usar hasta 15 puntos. Y entonces, eh, a esto le llamamos polígono. Es una forma de varios ángulos a tener muchos ángulos, polígono se parece más la longitud del polígono a la curva So to approximate the length of a curve you can break it up into many small segments of length ds which has a horizontal component of dx and a vertical component of dy By applying the Pythagorean theorem you found that ds equals the square root of dx squared plus dy squared Adding up the lengths of these very small ds's gives you the length of the entire curve. Adding up all these tiny pieces is the same thing as taking an integral. 
So this is the expression for the length of a curve. Usually, we like to do integrals with a dx or a dy sitting out on the right. Try finding an equivalent way to write this integral on the right so that it has a dx sitting out here by itself. We want to have a dx outside, so let's just put one there. Of course, if we multiply by dx, we have to divide by dx to keep the value the same. Now we can distribute this 1 over dx into the square root. 1 over dx is actually the square root of 1 over dx squared. See if you can take it from here. If we distribute this 1 over dx squared term into this square root, we now have the square root of dx squared over dx squared plus dy squared over dx squared. This leaves us with the square root of 1 plus dy dx, all that squared, dx. Precisely. You can multiply this expression inside the integral by dx and divide by dx so that the value of this expression doesn't change. Then you brought the 1 over dx inside the square root, giving you the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared. And this is a formula you can use to find the length of a curve. Let's go back to that parabola from the beginning, y equals x squared. Using this formula, can you find an expression for the length of this curve between the origin and what x equals 2? C ou A? All we need to know is what dy dx is. y is equal to x squared, and dy dx is the derivative of y with respect to x. So from the power rule, we know that dy dx is 2x. So this term is just 2x. Don't forget to square it. Nicely done. First off, you found that the limits of this integral were 0 and 2. You also found an expression for dy dx. y equals x squared. And the derivative of x squared is 2x. Let's plug the 2x in for dy dx in this integral. The square of 2x is 4x squared. And this definite integral is the length of this curve here. Unfortunately, this integral turns out to be really hard to evaluate. You can do it with a Riemann approximation on a computer. So good job with that. Now let's go back to the integral you found for the length of the curve. For the parabola, you knew y as a function of x. But say you have parametric equations, meaning you know both x and y as functions of another variable, which we'll call t. How can you now rewrite this integral on the right so that it's an integral with respect to t? Thank you.
A o C. A o C. No es la A. Es la C. Todo tiene que quedar en función de T. Todo. Aquí no está una ni función de T. Tanto X tiene que quedar en función de T como Y tiene que quedar en función de T. Well done. This time you multiplied and divided by dt. Then you moved the 1 over dt term into the square root, giving you the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. So when you have parametric equations, this is the formula you can use to find the length of a curve. Let's try another example. Suppose x equals r times the cosine of t, and y equals r times the sine of t, where r is a constant. Find the length of this parametric curve over the region from t equals 0 to t equals 2 pi. Cuando están dos intervalos, las dos funciones, y y, en función de t, vamos a ver la plana. Let's start by finding dx dt and dy dt. dx dt is the derivative of x with respect to t, and that's equal to r times the negative sine of t, or minus r times the sine of t. dy dt is the derivative of y with respect to t, and that's equal to r times the cosine of t. Plug these into the integral down here. Now that we've plugged in dx dt and dy dt, let's simplify the expression inside the square root. This is equal to r squared times sine squared t plus r squared times cosine squared t. Next, we can factor out the r squared, giving us sine squared t plus cosine squared t inside. But this is equal to 1, and so this leaves us with the square root of r squared, or r. We just found that this entire expression inside here is simply equal to r, giving us the integral from 0 to 2 pi of r times dt. We can pull the r out of the integral, leaving us with r times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of dt. This expression now simplifies to r times 2 pi minus 0 or 2 pi r. Does this look familiar? Good work. You got an answer of 2 pi r. Let's see if that answer makes sense. What does this parametric curve look like? When t equals 0, this curve starts on the x-axis and then circles all the way around until t equals 2 pi. Actually, this parametric curve is exactly a circle centered at the origin, and its radius is r. The length of this curve is the circumference of a circle of radius r, which you've just found is 2 pi r. And that's correct, so good work. So to summarize, you used the Pythagorean theorem to find two integral expressions that you can use to find the length of a curve. Use this expression when you can write y as a function of x, and use this expression for parametric equations. Vamos a dejarla aquí, y el próximo lunes vemos volúmenes y ecuaciones diferenciales, y probablemente con esto ya vamos terminando el curso. Eh, veíamos nada más si nos da tiempo eh, integrales impropias que no es eh, estrictamente indispensable verlo pero oh, yo creo que sí nos va a quedar tiempo eh, tenemos tres sesiones la próxima semana y todavía nos queda una sesión de la semana 11 porque coincide esa con la semana de asueto de jueves y viernes en los que 
viernes puede ganar alguien aquí en el Cerro de Estrella. Ok. Eh, nada más eh, voy a buscar la resolución del problema que nos atoró, porque ya lo tengo resuelto y lo tengo guardado en otro lado, pero pensé que lo podíamos resolver aquí rápido, no me acordé de la resolución, una disculpa de mi parte. Eh, la busco y la subo al grupo. Entonces nos vemos en el, este, el lunes. En...